having free and fair elections means every eligible American should be able to vote. Everyone, regardless of the color of their skin, their zip code, or physical or developmental ability. Rutgers University found that in the 2020 election, nearly 2 million Americans with disabilities had trouble getting their votes counted. And of course, 2 million votes matters in an election. In order to make sure that every vote is counted, the American Association of People with Disabilities has declared this Disability Voting Rights Week. Haley Moss is an advocate and attorney and also has autism, and Sharon Alexander is the CEO of the Unicorn Children's Foundation. So the good news is that people with disabilities voted in record numbers in 2020, but Rutgers found that a nearly six-point voting gap between people with disabilities and others, and that's a pretty significant gap. Haley, what is keeping a differently abled people from exercising their right to vote? Well, I think that the really obvious reason is the accessibility of polling places. You know, if, if we can't get people to the polls or if those polls are those polling places don't allow for individuals with motor impairments um, or maybe uh, visual impairments, um, that's going to impact their right to vote. And we saw a substantial increase from 2016 to 2020 because of the mail-in mail -in vote ballot. Okay. Um, but even still, you know, sometimes the language is a barrier to voting. And I'm going to let Haley talk more on the legal um, constraints that impact uh, people's ability to vote. Yeah, Haley, why don't you weigh in on that? Absolutely. And one of the biggest things that happens is that polling places are required to be accessible under the Americans with Disabilities Act. They aren't always accessible. And one of the biggest things that happens is even how do we cast our ballots? What is on the ballot? Do people understand it? How are we getting to our polling places? How are voters with disabilities being spoken to about the issues? Are they being made aware? We often, as voters with disabilities, are a group that politicians often forget to reach out to and don't recognize the power that this particular voting bloc does have. So Sharon, a state Supreme Court decision in Wisconsin really brought voting rights for the differently able into the spotlight. The court ruled that the only voters uh, only voters themselves could return their ballots in person and unsupervised ballot drop boxes were illegal. Can you explain to us why that court ruling led to a lawsuit? Um, I believe that may have actually been overturned. Um, but oh, it, was, it was overturned. Yes, Haley's the legal mind here, so I don't want to talk out of place. So I think she's probably best suited to answer that question. Yeah, Haley, I want you to talk about why the lawsuit was brought in the first case and why the successful nature of the lawsuit and overturning of that decision help to change the situation on the ground in Wisconsin? For sure. One of the big reasons that lawsuit was brought was actually an ADA violation. And think about who can vote and how people get to drop boxes. So what happens in this case, particularly is people with mobility disabilities or other physical constraints might not be able to get to that drop box or may not have any other options other than mailing in a ballot or require assistance to fill out that ballot. If you are someone who has limited mobility, a lack of transportation, or you need assistance, essentially what would have been happening is you are being denied the ability to vote privately and fairly, and the courts have recognized that this is indeed a violation under the ADA. So Haley, let's move from Wisconsin to Florida, where you do a lot of advocacy work. You recently had a big victory there. Tell us about that. Absolutely. So what I'm hoping with Florida, at least for me, one of the big victories is seeing more people with disabilities that are engaging in the civic process. And I know for me, I always find myself saying as an attorney how much privilege that I truly have to occupy as an autistic person, realizing that there's different ways that we're able to get things to be more accessible in order to keep bringing stories like mine to the forefront and making sure that people with disabilities were viewed as capable. We are getting registered to vote. We are being engaged in the political process at every single turn and not just on disability specific issues. I know that both of you do advocacy work that extends beyond just voting rights. Sharon, Unicorn Children's Foundation found that 82% of young adults with dis developmental delays in Florida are unemployed or underemployed despite their willingness and ability to work. That increases the odds that they will live in poverty and increases the risk of homelessness. So tell us about what you're doing to help change that dynamic. 
Yeah, so we know that 26% of individuals with disabilities live below the poverty level, and that's just not an acceptable option. And, you know, in today's day and age, I mean, this is one of the wealthiest countries in the world. So we're really working hard on creating cradle-to-career pathways, providing vocational training opportunities, doing some advocacy work. In fact, this evening, uh, we have an Access the Vote uh, panel on Zoom that's available that's going to talk about different individual stories, but also talking about the how to vote and what you need to know and how can we help. Next week, we're holding a national uh, voter registration day. People can come in on site to an accessible building where they'll be able to register. We'll have support there for them. Um, but really looking at the broad spectrum, you know, one in five kids are being diagnosed with a developmental or learning disorder. So if you are not personally impacted or have a family member that's impacted, you certainly know somebody who does. So we not, we really need to start um, addressing the stereotypes and the myths because as you can see with Haley, um, you know, the future is limitless if we're given the right opportunities. Haley, let's get to that limitless future. You are the first openly autistic lawyer in Florida. You are a success story. How are you now helping other autistic spectrum disorder or disordered people achieve their dreams in the state of Florida and in the country itself? I always look at stories like mine as something that should not be an exception, but rather the norm if given the right opportunity. A lot of people often think that I'm overcoming autism when really what I'm overcoming is barriers to access. So, so much of our world is inaccessible and we often doubt the capabilities of autistic people and similarly situated folks who are neurodivergent or disabled. So what I look at my work is doing is hopefully trying to really spark that conversation so we're having it more than just inside of an echo chamber of our own communities and really investing in people with disabilities and entering the workforce and having their existing workforces being more diverse, just doing whatever I can to hopefully make this world a better place. I still owe a lot to the generations that came before me. I was born after the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed and hoping to do more for who comes next so they don't have to face the same barriers, I think is really the legacy that I would like to be able to leave. Haley Moss and Sharon Alexander, very important conversation. Thank you so much to both of you. And that's it for this edition of Simone. I'm Charles Blow in for Simone.